because I could not get out of bed without a great deal of energy. Well, I can now, imagine. But now I'm much better, and boy, am I glad I we're having this meeting. Join Me too. Yeah, we had so much fun, met so many people at Alcon, uh, and the talks, oh my gosh, the speakers were all excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Debbie. <laughs> I was actually wondering how to respond to that, but I uh, appreciate it. The speakers were excellent. The they were. Of the, uh, of the uh, speakers and the enthusiasm of the audience. It was just perfect. And I'm counting the seconds next year in Kansas City. That's right. We're going to Kansas City towards the end of July, I believe. Mm -hmm. So it'll be great to have you out there. And it, it was, it's nice to see you. You know, we see each other online all the time, but to actually see each other in person is just so much better. Yeah, it is. You can't see each other online. You can't do that. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Well, I'm going to give Carol, I'm going to mute myself and give Carol a call. Yeah, I just tried to call him. Oh, okay. His phone went straight to voicemail, so. All right, I'll give it a try. <laughs> what is that song, David? That's from the, that's the Air Force. Uh, Anthem and it's, it comes a lot in the right stuff. <laughs> <laughs> There's a scene in the right stuff when everybody sings it. Mm. And they sing it the same way I just did. <laughs> exactly the same. Not exactly, but close. <laughs> close. There he is, uh, has muted herself so we cannot hear her secret conversations with mm -hmm. the senior official. Carol's online. Carol's here. It looks like the gang's all here. <laughs> yep, from that's from Pirates of Penzance. Hey, hey, the gang's all here. <laughs> We're all set to go here. There all set. Go. Hi, right. Carol. Hello, Dovid. <laughs> Hello, everyone. This is Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance, and I'm here with some great friends from the Astronomical League. Uh, this is the Astronomical League live program, and this week or this month we're featuring John Goss uh, but I'm going to turn it over to Terry Mann who is our host. Terry? Thank you very much Scott. Uh, please excuse us for being on a late start. We had a few technical issues. Uh, next time we'll do better. Try to be we'll there be on bad. time. Thank you for watching. That's my fault uh, guys. So. And that, no, that things happen. Things happen. Okay. So um, as Scott said, tonight we have, I think I'd like to really start off with just discussing Alcon a little bit before we bring on our keynote, which is John Goss. So, Carol, how about I'm going to let you start and maybe talk a little bit about Alcon. I think David and I definitely can chime in here. Sure. Yes, we just finished up our uh, annual convention, Alcon 2023 in Baton Rouge, and the host for that convention, uh, the Baton Rouge Astronomical Society put on a fabulous uh, event. Uh, the service was outstanding, and we had speakers, uh, starting with David Levy, who's on this broadcast, and we had something for everyone because there were many interests covered, and it was just a real pleasant experience. And Dave Acker, who is not on here, was our uh, keynote speaker at the banquet, and that's always a treat when we have uh, he and the uh, uh, David, uh, David Levy together. Uh, and uh, so it was just really a pleasant surprise and uh, not a surprise because they had been putting in the work, but it was really a well done. And so uh, uh, I don't know, remember the exact count. I think we had about 10 to 15 
major speakers and we had several panelists and there was something for everybody. And Terry, if you and uh, uh, David want to jump in. Yeah, I would just like to shout out to the Baton Rouge Astronomical Society. They did an amazing job. Everybody had fun. Everything went smooth from the outside, whether it did behind the scenes or not. It looked great from the outside. Uh, it was an amazing time. I It was one of the best outcomes so far. And I just really appreciated all the work they did. Uh, we had Fred Espinak. Um, we'll see. He was, oh, he did the planetarium show yeah. or planetarium program. He was fantastic. And just so many. I mean, the speakers list went on and on. So, and David, oh my gosh, you, you were amazing. Uh, and I'd like to mention he received the President's Award from the Astronomical League. Yes. So, congratulations. You deserve it. Well, also, we mustn't forget Brother Guy. I oh, mean, yeah. The guy was there. That's right. Brother Guy yeah. and the person he was speaking with. And the thing that got me the most about their lecture was that they were having so much fun giving it. <laughs> it yeah. was because they really were oh. enjoying themselves, both of them. They were. that. I went up and uh, Dan Davis, right? I went up and talked to him afterwards. Oh my gosh, they they just fed off of each other, and I just rolled laughing. They were so amazing. I mean, and and all of them, everybody, just Iker, Dave Iker, as, as a keynote. Oh my gosh, you couldn't help but to laugh, even when he's serious. He can make you laugh. He is an excellent speaker, also, buddy. I mean, we could name the whole list of speakers. Everybody that didn't go, y'all, y'all. Gee, I tried to get that right. <laughs> Y'all oh. missed a really good Alcon. So um, with that, I guess then, David, how about if we go to you? Well, I thank you. Um, this is kind of a tradition that these ASAL live meetings and I do a little quote. And this is the same one I did at the Global Star Party. So uh, just last week. So if any of you were uh there, it's going to be the same thing. So you, if you want to run out and get some coffee while I'm doing this or hear it again. This is from. Um, this is from. Who is who is now? This is where Dolby's brain kind of gets mixed up a little bit. Leonard Cohen. Sorry about that. Leonard Cohen. I. I missed him by about 10 years. He went to the same elementary school as me, same high school, McGill, same congregation, Sharshamayim. In fact, his father and grandfather essentially founded the Sharshamayim. But he wrote a song for the various places album that came out in the early 80s called Hallelujah. And I remember reading that they had a meeting with Leonard and some of the um, record officials. And when they got to Hallelujah, they didn't want to include it. And Leonard got really upset and he said, I spent a year mostly on the floor trying to write the song. And uh, the record people said, yeah, but what if it isn't any good? And like everybody just cracked up and they laughed, including Leonard. And the record people said, okay, let's just leave it on the second side, which he agreed to. And for a number of years, the record company was right. It was, it got, it was popular, but not the most popular in that album. And then in the mid 90s, I remember watching an episode of West Wing, one of my favorite programs, and they played Hallelujah in the background to one of the sadder scenes. And it wasn't Leonard Cohen's version, it was uh, Buckley's version, I think. And uh, anyway, I decided to add a verse to it, and I'm going to sing it to you right now. And here it is. <clears throat> it's time to go outdoors tonight. The sky is dark. Some stars are bright. The Milky Way shines overhead. You see uh, a comet rises in the east. With end to strife, it brings us peace and calls us to a cosmic hallelujah, 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 
Hallelujah. Thank you for letting me do that. Thank you, David. Appreciate that. Uh, you know, I was sitting here thinking one person we didn't think or thank was Scott. Again, he did broadcasting for us. He broadcasted the banquet. He interviewed so many of the people that were at Alcon. So, Scott, thank you, too. You're high on that list. Thank you very yeah. much. And I love, the background I, I love the background you chose. The, uh, the VLA. I just think oh, me. Okay. Thank yeah, you. <laughs> I have to stop and think here. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. Nice you could have that in your backyard, yeah. Terry. I wish it was. <laughs> yeah, that would be fine with me. Uh, so, but thank you, David. Thank you so much. And, you know, I think what we're going to do since we got a late start is just go ahead and go to John. Um, let me talk a little bit about John Goss. It's one of my favorite, per one of my favorite people to introduce. Uh, John has been with the league for quite a long time. Um, he had, I don't know for sure. I know he's past president. I'm sure he was a vice president. Um, he's kind of been with, along with many of us that are on council, but he is the current media officer and John does such an amazing job. When you see announcements, you see flyers. He's the man that's been doing them. And sometimes we call him at the like five minutes before we need something. So it's like, John, we really would appreciate if you could have that done in two hours. And he always comes through. And that is really so great for any volunteer organizations such as the league, people that you can depend on that when you really need something done, they are there. And John Goss is definitely one of those people. And he is amazing. I call him the master of lunacy because he was on a AL Halloween show and he did such an amazing talk about the moon. So he is a great speaker and I am very honored to have him tonight. So John, I will let you either talk about your talk or just do your talk, whichever you'd like. Thank you so much for being here. Okay. Uh, th thank you, Terry. A lot of that was unnecessary, but th thank you anyway. Um, yeah, I, I I do have a few things to say tonight. Start out here. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see if we can start with this. I appreciate everyone tuning in tonight, especially af after the the delay. So, sometimes things can can't be avoided. And I know if I just talk about, if I tell you all the word Zoom, you will all realize that, yeah, we all have had problems with, with Zoom trying to get things perfectly situated, but it looks like things are going okay right now. Let's talk about real observing and what it is, and at least what I think it is and how I, how I enjoy observing. And I, and I hope I can convey some of that to you. Tonight, we're going to be looking more at the question of, of why we do observing as opposed to how or what, although we will be discussing that too. But, you know, when we, every time we go outside and look at the night sky, we are, in a sense, on a journey of exploration. Many times we don't know what, what we're going to be looking for. Uh, we may have an idea, but things just don't turn out like that. But whatever happens... We see things in the sky. We want to find out what's up there. But when, when it's all said and done, at the end of the evening, we come away with a pretty good feeling. And that's what observing is all about. Um, you, you want something from it and something that you gain within yourself. So we'll, we'll mention some of those things. So let, let me uh, get started on some of this stuff. Maybe not. Okay, good. Good. Uh, a few minutes ago, I apologized to, to D David Levy for leading off here with a poem, but this is probably one of the most famous poems um, that has to do with the night sky, and it's by Walt Whitman. Uh, he wrote this in about 1865, so it's been around a while, and a lot of people have read it and pondered over its meaning. This is part of it. It's called, uh, When I Heard Learn Astr Astronomer. I wandered off by myself in the mystical moist night air, and from time to from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. 
Now, those three lines are the, are the most quoted, and that is something we're going to be focusing, focusing, I like that, on tonight. Uh, but there's another aspect of this poem. It's the first uh, half dozen lines, which I'd like to repeat uh, in just a moment. This tells, this is the one of the top 10 reasons for stargazing. This is number eight, that every time we go out and look under the stars, uh, spend some time looking through our telescope, setting things up, looking at meteors, looking at comets, nebula, galaxies, and so on. We're always outside where we can enjoy this, the sounds and smells of the night air. And that's what this guy in the poem was doing. He went out to look at the uh, night sky himself, and he wants to experience nature at night. But the first part of this poem was, if I can get this right here. Sorry, I had to move things around on my screen. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were arranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I sitting heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became tired and sick, till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical moist night air and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. Well, evidently, this guy was at a lecture. Remember, this is 1865, so this was one of the primary ways people um, found out about astronomy as well as other topics. He was at a lecture, and the professor up there was talking about astronomy and talking about facts and figures and numbers and charts and graphs and all this stuff. Um, but he wanted to see this stuff for himself. He went outside to experience the night sky for himself, which is what the last few lines talked about. So we have two opposing stands here, wanting to go out and personally feel the night sky and also appreciating the science behind it to enhance our learning and appreciation of what we see in the sky. So tonight we're gonna to be talking a little bit about both. So let's get on with that. There we go. So you may have all experienced something like this. You've had a long drought of astro of, of, from astronomy. You've had um, weeks of cloudy nights, rainy nights, windy nights. Uh, you haven't been able to get out with a telescope. You haven't been able to get out with binoculars to look at the night sky. But finally, you do. Finally, it's like tonight. It's a nice Friday night. The moon isn't rising until a couple, three hours after sunset. You got some time to spend under the stars, to enjoy yourself, to appreciate what's up there. So you go out with your telescope, set things up. For me, I find this kind of a, a, a very good experience to do. Taking the telescope out, setting it up, aligning uh, it with north if, if you have to. Um, you, uh, align your finder uh, with the scope. Uh, you take, you have your eyepieces there. You slide in your favorite eyepiece, just that sound of the eyepiece going in the focuser. You um, point it at the sky, you bring the sharp stars into sharp focus. I find that very satisfying by itself. So that brings us to another top 10 reason for stargazing. You know, uh, uh, now this is something Scott can talk about probably for the next three hours. That is the, the, the relishing the feel and precision of well-crafted equipment, since that's his business. See, so, you know, here's a little plug for you, Scott. Uh, you know, explore scientific as well I, as other. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, well, yeah, but that's true. You know, you 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 use some of this equipment, and, and, and this isn't just thrown together. I mean, this stuff is. We're talking tolerances of, of, of thousands of an inch, and and surfaces ground to like a millionth of a, of a, I don't know, a meter or whatever. Wavelength of light. Yeah, wavelengths of light. That's what we were talking about. This is well-crafted stuff. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it, it, this stuff feels really good. Turn that telescope on its axis, turn that focuser, you know things are, are going to be working really well. So that's number six. But close to that is 6B, and that's enjoying the satisfaction of your own equipment that you make. You know, uh, I, these big observatories have, have the super telescopes and all this multi-million dollar stuff. Well, it turns out that you can make a lot of this on a much smaller scale at home for yourself. 
Um, and if you have the expertise to do that, you get a lot of satisfaction doing that. You get a lot of satisfaction of, of, of pointing your own equipment at the sky and seeing some of these star clusters and planets and nebula through the stuff that you made. I can go on, on and on about this, so I better not. But that's pretty cool, I think. So there you are under the stars, finally. Sun's going down. Not quite dark enough, but you got things set up. You see your first star up there, um, which we'll find out in a moment that this is Arcturus. And you have a plan, but then it takes an unexpected turn. You know, a lot of non-astronomers uh, think that we we like taking our telescopes out and looking at bright stars. Hey, that's a bright star. Let's, let's point and see what it looks like. And we all know that that, that bright star is just going to look even brighter through our telescope. You know. It's not all that exciting. But one night I was out and there was Arcturus. I've, I've, I probably had never looked at it with a telescope before, but I had to this night because I wanted to align my finder scope uh, with, with my main telescope. So I had to have a bright star that I, that I could use for the alignment purposes. So I pointed my telescope up towards Ar Arcturus. Okay. Let's see if I got this right. Oh, okay, there's Arcturus. Point my telescope up towards it. And what do I see? Well, in my field of view, about one, one degree, okay, not, Arcturus wasn't really quite in that field, but it was in my, my finer scope because it, it wasn't quite aligned with my telescope. But there through my one degree field of view, there are a couple of stars. But then I look closely and I notice, what, what is that? Now there are seven stars, very faint stars right below Arcturus. And here I am, you know, I, I, I never heard this before. So I think, oh, you know, I discovered something. Well, I t I've never discovered anything in the sky originally, but for myself, I sure have. And I did that that one night. This is a, an asterism. It's just a chance grouping of seven stars, very dim stars called Pico 1. And it is right below Arcturus. And it looks like, well, you can imagine what it kind of looks, looks like a, uh, um, an omega sign, or uh, it's also called a French field marshal's hat. Napoleon's hat, whatever. But um, people like giving these whimsical names to these things. But this is something I saw. And in a way, I discovered it for myself. And this is completely unexpected. And there are other things out there you'll stumble across as well. But this is something to keep in mind. Not all these um, adventures you're going to have under the night sky are planned. This is completely unplanned. And the Astronomical League knows about some of these things. We have a flyer, which we put out. In fact, we, we put out on Facebook um, a couple months ago, which explains this particular feature. Hats off to Pico One. So if you want to look more about this, look on our Facebook site and scroll, scroll down for about two months and you'll, keep, you'll bump into this. So something to consider. But this is another reason for stargazing. Number nine. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to go through all 10. But we'll just do a few of these. Nine. It keeps your mind sharp. You know, you're always, you got to be in there. You always got to be paying attention, watching what you're doing, because you're always going to be learning stuff. Um, and if you don't, you know, you're going to miss some pretty interesting uh, sites. So you go on your journey. So tonight, what we're going to do is go to NGC 4244. This is a galaxy. It's... Um, not extremely well known, but obviously a lot enough people know about it. But this is uh, an it's an interesting piece because it 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 comes across. Uh, when I first saw it, um, I'll, I'll explain what happened when I when I what I said. It was a nice word. What I said when I first saw it. So we'll we'll do a little journey in how to find this this uh, interesting galaxy. Well, first of all, you got to consult your favorite star chart to find out where this guy is. It's in the um, spring to late summer sky. In fact, you can see it tonight, uh, I guess an hour, or let's say an hour and a half, two hours after sunset before it drops too low in the northwestern horizon. Well, let's uh, look a little bit closer and we'll point it right out to you. Now, I'm not going to go and talk about reviewing the night sky with you. I assume that everybody who's watching this broadcast um, knows the Big Dipper. Well, you take the handle of the Big Dipper, the arc of it, the curve of it, you'll notice that there are two stars situated pretty much right at the curve or the center of the curve of the handle, alpha and beta. Um, Canum vena or something like that. I don't pronounce all these things. We'll zoom in a little bit closer. And if you look just to their Southwest, you'll see NGC 4244. 
it isn't really hard to find. In fact, if you draw a line between alpha and beta and then continue that, making a pretty much of a right triangle for an equal distance to the southwest, you'll bump right into it. So it's a fairly easy galaxy to find. Yes, to find, at least to th think you find, but to actually see it is not quite so easy. Let's talk about that. First of all, um, what you want to do is, 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 is find some guide stars to help you out with this. And there is star number six, which is uh, it's about 5.5 uh, magnitude. So it's pretty dim. But if you're in a clear sky, you'll be able to just see it. Your finer scope will pick it out pretty easily. I have a two degree field circle there, which is the field for my eyepiece, my lowest power eyepiece through my, I have an eight inch uh, F4, uh, which means it gives a nice wide field of view. So this is a great instrument to use for finding this, something like this, which we're gonna do this. Looking through the telescope, this is my drawing. And you can see there's star number six up in the uh, upper, upper left, two degree field of view. Well, the galaxy, which I can see, I know right where it is, and I can see it on, on my monitor here. It is in, in, in this field. So we're gonna see if we can find it. But first of all, remember when you use uh, a reflecting telescope such as mine, everything is inverted or flipped around 180 degrees. So that's what we're doing here. Uh, you might remember a few slides ago, uh, the galaxy was to the Southwest of star number six. So, here, it's still to the southwest, but that, now that's to the upper left. So let's see if we can find it. Uh, it's pretty much right in the center of the field of view. I don't know if you can see this. And that's kind of the point of, of what I'm going to talk about. I'll, I'll, I'll point it out here more in, in, in a moment. But it is right smack in the center of the field of view. Um, remember, I had an 8-inch telescope. If you have a bigger telescope, the thing's going to be brighter and easier to see. But you kind of lose the impact of, of what I found, at least found for myself. See, well, can't remember what happens next. Ah, okay. You also know through your research that there is a uh, quadrangle of stars uh, that's to the galaxies, at least in this uh, perspective, to the upper upper left of it. So the arrow points right to the galaxy. Can 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 you see it on there? I, I, you know, it, it's it's this is so faint. I see it on mine, but don't worry, we'll, we'll tackle that in a moment. So this is through a um, two degree field of view. So it's pretty low power. What happens next. Not quite sure what all my slides say. Okay, this is also called the Silver Needle Galaxy. Now it's right in the center of the field of view. Does anybody see it there now? Mm. Some, some are a nod, some are a shake. Okay. Okay. Well, it, we I go. increased the brightness. This is a, this is a drawing. So I, I've used the, the the magic of my computer to to enhance this galaxy. But you can see it's a thin silver needle, a thin streak going from the uh, upper left to the lower right. We can call it the dehydrated galaxy. It, it well, it, it is very much so. Let's, let's go back to this one. It's it's in there. It's, this is pretty much how it looked like to me when I first saw it. I knew it was there, and my words I said were were the the oh wow the oh wow experience. Oh wow, look at that! I can see it, but you may not be able to. So I'll just enhance it so we will be able to see it. But you look at that, and 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 if you don't know what that was, if this is the first time you came across it without knowing much about the sky, if you're if you're showing your your friends in the sky what what this is really really like, they'll look at this and you ask, what is it? Gee, I don't know what it is. It, it, it's a silver needle. It's a streak. Uh, you know, unless you know something about the science of astronomy, would you be thinking galaxy? It, be, well, what is this? You know, I, I can't tell any real detail on it. It's it has about the same brightness along the thin streak. It might be a little bit brighter in the in the central portion of it. But what is it? That brings us to the top three reason for stargazing. And that has experienced a very special wow moment of seeing something astounding. When you talk about people about the oh wow moment, just about everyone will mention the word Saturn. We have we have seen Saturn through telescopes and it is really cool. We show Saturn to the public and they're just like, wow, wow, wow. By and large, there's always a few people who go, yeah, yeah, right. But by and large, they're really gonna, gonna like that. 
you yourself, as you pursue uh, the avocation of airman astronomy, you're going to come across these things. This this is one for me, kind of an oh wow experience, seeing that silver streak going across. A couple of years ago, I saw the uh, Veil Nebula through the same small telescope, which I had seen before in a large telescope, but I saw it in a small one, and to me, it was an oh wow thing because I could see the nebulosity. Pretty cool stuff, I was thinking. I encourage you, I encourage you that when you're out under the stars looking for this stuff, you come across a site like this. You try, you ought to try your hand sketching it. As far as sketching goes, this galaxy is one of the easiest things to sketch because you can just see why. It's just a little streak there. And um, I, I encourage you to do it. In fact, I'm going to show you a little bit more about how to sketch this thing. People ask me, you know, how do you go about drawing the stars there? And I don't know. Okay, well, let's look at that. First thing you want to do when you sketch, well, actually, it might be the first thing you want to do when, when you start looking through your telescope at the beginning of the, of the evening. You want to figure out which way west is and which way north is. West isn't really all that hard to find. You just know which, which way the stars drift into the field of view. That's west. And where they drift out, well, that, that's east. Let's see what we can do here. So as this, the stars come across the sky, you know, the Earth is rotating, so the stars come across the sky, it's drifting west. So now you know where west is. And on this same picture, I can see the galaxy on there. I don't know if you can, but it's there. Uh, you push the telescope towards uh, the North Pole, and that'll show you which way north is. So now you know west and north. That's handy to have. So when you sketch, First thing you do, you know you feel the view. This is a two inch eyepiece, which is that central uh, uh, red circle. The outer one is six degrees. Know your field of view, you know north and west. Now you try to put your uh, target right in the center of the field of view. And then you carefully, it might take a, a minute or two, you, but you carefully plot the brighter stars on your drawing. And you can use the brighter stars then as reference to where the dimmest stars are. You carefully add the dimmer stars. Um, then you do your best to depict whatever object you're seeing, that, that streak right across. Okay, kind of get that. Draw that in there. So when you're doing this, for galaxies at least, when, you, when you're doing this, and you, um, you want to note some things like, it's, you know, obvious stuff like a size, it's apparent dimensions, uh, thickness, length, and stuff. Is it uniform in brightness? Does it have a bright central core? Or is it fuzzy? You know, how does this core look? Is it star-like? Are there any spiral arms visible? Well, in this one, no, because you're viewing this thing edge on, which I'll explain more in a moment. It's position angle, which is just the tilt of it from uh, on, a, on the north uh, direction. And are there any other galaxies in there? And this one, there, well, there surely are many other galaxies in this field, but my telescope can only pick out this particular one. I thought that was pretty cool. And you wanna do this, you wanna draw it because the more you, you draw, it forces you to look carefully at what you're seeing and you can understand a little bit better what, what you're seeing. Now, this is the same galaxy taken by the Hubble. Okay, it's, it's about 70,000 light, light years wide and less than 8,000 light years thick. In fact, it's probably about 4,000 light, light years thick. Um, so obviously you're not gonna see this, but this is the type of thing that you're really looking at. Hmm. So that does it for 42, Let's go on to one more. I'm not gonna spend the whole night looking at the whole sky doing this stuff, but you'll see what I mean. Let's go to NGC 4565, which is another thin galaxy, much more famous. Um, in fact, I venture to say that probably everybody here has seen this thing, and it's something to look at, to find. It's not hard to find. Again, it's in the same part of the sky that uh, for, uh, 4244 is, a little bit further south. In fact, it's near the uh, Coma Berenice's open cluster. So if you can see that in the sky, which you, you really can from any reasonably dark location, you can see this cluster. You can find the galaxy pretty easily. But what are you going to see? Well, this is another needle galaxy. This isn't the silver needle galaxy. This is just the original needle galaxy, uh, NGC 4565. It's, it's a lot brighter. It's a lot easier to see. And it's just not one long streak. You can see that it does have a central bulge shot. Again, this is with an eight inch telescope, which is 
it isn't really a large telescope as far as amateurs go, but it's certainly large enough to see this. Larger telescopes can see even more detail in the galaxy. Um, you can see some uh, a dark streak right down the center of the needle. Uh, the central bulge will become much much more noticeable. But this is something that, uh, that, that you want to look at. In fact, you look at this, and you're going to want to start comparing it, what you saw with 42, 44, and how different they are. Similar that they're both thin streaks, but they're different in many ways. Of course, here's the Hubble seeing something like this. Quite interesting, you know, but this is what you're looking at through your telescope. Through my telescope, you know, it was uh, that nice thin streak with a little bulge in it. A larger telescope can be a little bit better. But it, it you start thinking about what's up there. What is all what, what is all this stuff we're, we're looking at? Compare the two. You know, they're similar type of bodies, but yet they're different. So just because you, you like looking at uh, galaxies, it doesn't mean they're all going to look alike. Just because you like looking at star clusters, it doesn't mean they're going to look alike. They're all, they all have differences. But that could be very interesting in, in knowing some of this stuff. Let's go on a little, uh, excuse me, a little bit more. What I'd like to do, uh, okay, I'm looking at 4244. It's a galaxy some 14 million light years away. And it's, a, it's an edge on. Thin, thin galaxy, thin spiral galaxy. Uh, this one and the 4565 both are located near the Milky Way's North Pole, which means that from their point of view, from these galaxies' point of view, when they look back towards the Milky Way, they, they see our galaxy as being face on. When you start realizing some of this stuff, what you're looking at that little thin galaxy from their point of view, we're a nice big fat round galaxy. That's, uh, I think that's pretty amazing. Um, let's take another look at this. This is an, an artist's conception, my conception of what the Milky Way would look like from a resident who lived on the edge of, uh, on the rim of 42, 44. If you have a telescope, small telescope, this is gonna, uh, Milky Way will definitely look something like this. I don't, who knows, but it's something to, to uh, simulate your imagination with. I also like thinking of how far away these things are and how large they are or small, depending on how you look at it. Well, here we are at our galaxy, Milky Way, our thickness of our galaxy. And when we're, when we're seen on edge on, our thickness is about 0 0.003 million light years or let's say 3000 light years. But the diameter is about 100,000 light years or 0.1 million light years. So let's look at that. Let's take, take that a little bit more and, and take a journey to to see how far away NGC 4244 is, the object that we just looked at through a small telescope. So here we are, we start out in uh, about less than 200,000 light years. Uh, it's the distance to the Magellanic clouds, but not in the same direction. Let's see what happens. Go to a million light years, okay. Two million light years, 2.6 distance to the Andromeda galaxy, 3 million light years. Yep, we're gonna go through them all. 4.3 to, to some other galaxy, which I've never heard of, 5 million light years. You know, we're still going, we're still going. 6 million light years to NGC 300, a great fall galaxy. 7 million, 8 million. Aren't you glad this isn't 120 million light years away? Come on. 9.6 to M94, 10 million. We're still going. We're not there yet. 11, 12, almost to 12 to M81, popular galaxy. Great, great thing to look at. 13, 14 million light years. Finally, that's the distance on a distance scale of how far away we were looking at that thin streak. You think about that. Now that we should come away with some type of weird feeling. Now let's look at 4565 quite a bit further. So I got a smaller, smaller graph or larger graph, depending on how you think about it. But you can see Milky Way down at the bottom, the Andromeda Galaxy, M81, as you go further away, NGC 4244. Okay. So where's 4565? Hmm. Don't worry, this isn't as bad. 891 is a great galaxy. There we go. 4565 is about 43, there it goes, 43 million light years. We're still going out for this Messier galaxy M109. 
It's about 83, 82 million light years away. So just as, a, as a, the, the text says at the top, try to appreciate the distance of that galaxy because that's what you're looking at. Through that small telescope of yours, that thin streak, that's how, how far you're, 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 you're really looking. Which brings us to number four for our top reason, top 10 reasons for stargazing. Confronting astronomical numbers, you know, both the very large and the very small, from the infinitesimal to the infinite, from now to eternity, because we have both distance and time. Think about that as you're looking for these objects. Now, I'm going to um, see what, what else we're going to look at. We're, we're, we're wrapping up here, but I want you to know that there are many other objects in the sky you can see. You know, you get various, various um, nebula, uh, M27, great object. Um, another galaxy, I can't remember what that is, but I drew it, yeah, can't remember. The globular cluster is M55. Now M55 is, we're coming into the really the prime time of the year to look at M55. It's in Southwestern Sagittarius. But Sagittarius is, is such a painful, painful place to look around because it's so low in the sky and it rises so late. But now it rises early enough or when the sun goes down, the constellation is high enough that you can see this. M55, interesting object to look at, globular cluster. <clears throat> and the other object there is, I, I, it's covered up by, by my people on the screen there, so I, I can't see it, but it, it's something cool, I'm sure. But anyway, so as the night proceeds, you go through a lot of these, these different objects. And they're all just as wonderful to look at. They're mysterious. They, they're unique to themselves. And you're focused on exactly what you see, how far away they are, what the telescope reveals, what it doesn't reveal, its shapes, its, its uniformity, and all that. And it's I look very, at those sketches, and I think Mozart. They are wonderful. Um, yeah, well, th well th thank you. Um, that is, I, I'm just trying to de depict how it looks like to me through, through a telescope. Somebody else, you guys would probably draw a little bit differently, but th this is what I ended up with on that night. That's what it means to me. This is what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. Thank you. Um, so we're going to wrap this up, kind of. But let me uh, see what I got here. I have some points I'd like to make. So the number one reason, when we're all said and done with all this stargazing stuff, the number one reason why you do it, here I'm telling you why, why you do it. This is why I do it. Uh, number one is seeing the universe as it truly is with your own eyes. When I was looking at 4244, the galaxy, that's with my own eyes. That's not, that's not a Hubble image. Of course, the Hubble isn't going to see any of that. And through your own telescope, you're going to see a little bit differently. And this is how I like ending a lot of my um, uh, my my talks because I think it really hits it on the head that with our trained eyes we appreciate like no one else the starry realm that lies over our heads and beneath the rocky globe at our feet. With our binoculars, telescopes, and cameras, we see planetary worlds that are nothing like our own. We see light that left distant distant suns long before Columbus sailed the ocean blue. We see spectacular star cities whose distances and sizes numb our minds. We see galaxies as they existed millions of years before humans walked this earth. We are the ones who see these things. We are the ones who see this immense universe firsthand, firsthand, without prejudice or fear. Our view, both visual and mental, is not restricted to our small planet in this corner of the cosmos. What other group of people can truthfully say that? Indeed, our avocation is like no other. So as you break down your telescope for the evening, you're gonna come away with a different feeling. You'll be changed a little bit differently. You'll have a better understanding of what the sky really holds. Or you may have an understanding that it's just big and you're, you're, you're so small. It's, it's, gonna, it's gonna change you. In fact, if, if you, show a lot of these things to friends or at a star party and they can really get into this telescope, they're going to come away wondering about all the big pictures in life of the universe of themselves and all that, all because of you, all because of your telescope. So keep that in mind. Thank you for listening to this. I hope there is some inspiration to actually get out there and see what's going on. I do have one more thing to say, a little off topic, 
But again, it's focused right on this. Let's uh, see what that is, if I can explain this, I hope. Observer, telescope, and sky. Thank you for all that. Let's go on to this one last bit. So you know that you're an astro amateur astronomer when? Three weeks ago, my uh, Genevieve and I decided to go to the opera in Charlottesville. I live near Roanoke, Virginia, and it just so happens the Northeast Regional Train starts in Roanoke and goes through Charlottesville. So we hopped on the train, two and a half hours, got off at Charlottesville, had lunch, went to the theater. Is it clicking? Went to the theater and we had a great time. And we saw, we saw Tosca. Now, Tosca is an opera. It's one of those operas in which everyone gets killed in the end. So it's, it's not a very happy ending. But it is known for some pretty good arias. Um, I think about the third, second to the last scene, you have Tosca lamenting about her doomed lo lover, uh, Cavaradosi. I don't know all these names. Cavaradosi, how he's going to be executed at dawn. So she's singing in front of a backdrop of stars, not, not this particular image. Uh, this image, by the way, is courtesy of, of Bob King, who does some, some great stuff, and he's been on, on this, this program before, and he was nice enough to, to let, let me use it. And when I explained it to him, he was, he was laughing about it. But anyway, so there we are, sitting in the opera, backdrop of stars in the, of the summer sky, and, and like any good astronomer, I start thinking, hey, is that the summer triangle? Yeah, yeah, I, I think I can see the summer triangle. Let me see. Yeah, there's Deneb. And, no, there's Vega at the top and Deneb over there and Altair down, down to the lower right. Summer triangle. Oh, yeah. There, there, there's the great rift going right, right through Cygnus and, and the northern coal sack up by, by Deneb. And I look a little closer and I go, oh, you know, here's the parallelogram of, 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 of Lyra. And, and I, I bet you um, I can see, oh, this is uh, Omicron uh, Cygni, which is, Another surprise experience is one of those uh, serendipitous discoveries you're going to have if you look at these stars through a telescope. And you go, what is all this stuff? This is, this is really cool. Yeah, what else can I see? Well, of course, the test here is, can you see the coat hanger? Yeah, yeah, there it is. Look at all the stars. I can see it. I can see it. I'm kind of nudging Genevieve. I can see the coat hanger. And then I'm realizing, hey, wait a minute. You know, we spent good money to hear this opera. And, and she's up there singing greatly, you know, the, one of the most famous pieces of this opera. And here I am, completely tuning her out, looking at this, thinking, oh, yeah, coat hanger, uh, summer, summer triangle, uh, you know, all this stuff. I'm not, paying, I'm not paying attention to the opera anymore. Ah, you get in trouble. So that is how you know you're an amateur astronomer. The sky is always in the back of your mind, ready to leap forward at a moment's notice even taking center stage in Tosca. So anyway, thank, thank you for listening to that. And uh, if, you, if, any, if these people on board have any questions, I'd be happy to kind of stumble through them if, if, if you have any. So thank you. Thank you. I have a question of everybody. I want you to be honest here. How many, even of the viewers watching, how many of you have done at one time or another what John just did? All of a sudden, there's a picture somewhere of the stars. And you do, you immediately start naming what you can see and you lose, you lose control with everything right in front of you. I have done that so many times. Now, everybody else, be honest, haven't you? Yes. Yeah, and we got people in the audience raising their virtual hands. So Yeah, yeah. Yes. absolutely. Yeah, well, I think I, one of mine is when you see a picture of the moon, uh, let's say, say a crescent moon, a drawing or something, you start thinking, why is that star inside the, the crescent of the moon? That, that's impossible. You know, that, this is wrong. Or, or we, we like watching uh, British murder mysteries, and a lot of these you have the full moon rising in the background. And I'm thinking, huh, is, is that a full moon? Is that rising? Is that really in the east? Or could that should be in the west, you know, the way it's. You know, so you stop paying attention to, to, to what you're supposed to be watching, get in trouble. <laughs> yeah. And how many times we've seen something reversed 
that we knew wasn't supposed to be reversed or yeah we found the stakes in what we yeah we've seen stuff you know we i think we all do it because we're so used to looking at the sky (laughs) you know it's amazing the things we do david one of the things that i wanted to say is that in that opera the background of stars was accurate i mean that really got to me and as soon as you saw that i'm pointing out stuff and like the coat hanger i mean they could easily have just painted white spots on the yeah. back background but they got it accurately a little story about the wonderful neil tyson when the uh titanic movie came out the, the second edition on the 100th anniversary of the sinking they added neil tyson's supposedly correct version of the sky so i went to see the movie wendy and i went to see the movie and when they got to that scene I could not identify a single star in it. And I, I'm not a newbie, you know. I, I know the sky a little bit. I'm familiar with it. And I wrote to Neil and I said, I think they didn't use your picture. And he said, oh, yeah, they did. The stars are accurate. And I said, sorry, Neil, they're not. And we left it with that. And it's been years ago now. <laughs> <laughs> But I'll tell you that the picture I showed, uh, the Summer Triangle, that was from Bob Kane, his his photograph was a lot better than what was projected on the wall of the theater. And I really did have trouble finding some of this stuff because it wasn't obvious. I thought, that, well, that's got to be Vega and that's got to be Dan Evan Altair. And it was, it was just good enough. These... What's that? It was good enough. No, good, good enough. Well, it alerted me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I do have one. Go. Sorry, David. No, One question. <laughs> John, you are basically a visual observer, right? Pretty much. I, I let everybody I let everybody else do the hard stuff and, and do that photography. Well, for and your sketches, honestly, were amazing. But could you give, say, if we've got beginners watching, could you give us an idea? You said you have an eight-inch F4 telescope. Yeah. How deep in the sky can you see? the faintest magnitude that you have seen with your telescope? Well, as far as galaxies go, you pretty much saw it just, just then. I was just <laughs> yeah, that's able it. to pick that right. up. But stars, uh, um, well, I know I can do 12. I don't, what about I don't globulars, think, even, I things like that? Good. Well, c- certainly all, all the messy stuff. In fact, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. Uh, 10th magnitude. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, you can see all the Messier oh, yeah. with an eight inch. If you have people here that are watching that might want to buy a telescope. Um, what maybe any of you know, what would be the smallest telescope a person could buy that they could see all of the Messier objects? Geez, to see all the Messier. Well, the smallest telescope that would be worth buying really depends on on. And what you want to do with it, your your expertise level, what you want to go in this amateur astronomy. You know, even a very small telescope, uh, you, well, you're certainly not going to see this stuff, but you can see the moon and the planets. But if you yeah. want to see galaxies like this, it'd have to be eight inches larger. Um, yeah. You know, a, a ten inch would do it, but an eight inch. I like doing the eight inch because it's it's a it's a real challenge. You saw, I could yeah. I don't know if you could see it, but I could just barely see this thing. And and I, I know if I get a bigger telescope, I'll be able to see it. And, oh yeah, there it is. Sure, it looks, looks, sure. But but and then you have the problem with the aperture because then you turn around and start trying to find even dimmer galaxies. So right. for me, if if I had a a fifteen inch, well actually I do have a fifteen inch telescope, I would still be trying to find that dimmest thing I can see. Yeah. The other stuff, but anyway, that's just me. Yeah, but you know, an eight inch too, that I can lift up um, an eight inch SCT, you know, Smith Cassegrain, I can handle putting that on a mount and I can handle, um, you know, moving it around. And that's one of the things people usually have to do is take, take it set up in their own yard or travel with it. Um, So that, that is a nice, easy one. And maybe an 80 millimeter refractor. Yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, I I think brings it. I've had conversations with uh, Maynard Pittendre about this, and he keeps complaining that as he gets older, his telescopes keep getting heavier and heavier. And I know exactly what he means. 
You know, yeah. 40 pounds, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago wasn't too bad, but now lifting this thing is. Yeah. Yeah, that happens. Uh, Scott brought up an interesting thing. There was an article on s and where the Herschel 400 was completed by an amateur with a 70 millimeter. That's mm-hmm. amazing. I do not remember that article. Yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, something I didn't quite expect. But I will mm-hmm. tell you that I have been to very dark sc- sites mm-hmm. before. Once at the Texas Star Party, I took a 60 millimeter toy refractor and I showed to the dismay or to the shock of people with a bunch of large Dobsonians, I showed them the Whirlpool galaxy and you could definitely tell it was the Whirlpool. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yep. It's a, so, yeah, it's amazing you what you can do in dark skies. The right low power and all the rest of it. Uh, and you, I think all of us know people that have used seven by 50 binoculars and seen a lot of Mercier objects and a lot of deep sky objects. Not very large, very small, you know, but uh, those that's only two inches, right? Mm-hmm. 50 millimeters. So, mm-hmm. um, but the really gratifying where you're like soaking it in and you go, wow, okay, this is great. This is what, this is what I want to see. John, I'd have to agree. It probably starts at about eight inches of aperture. Me too. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. So anybody you know, I, thinking about that? I also like thinking about if like this um, 4244, 14 million light years away. So it took light 14 million years to get from there to here. And I think, oh, what was happening on Earth 14 million years ago when light left that galaxy? Well, I, I did look it up. Um, of course, it's long before the age of humans, but it was like in the middle time of when mammals were being evolving and and such. The it's uh, not as far back as when the Rocky Mountains were formed, but it, it's it's getting 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 pretty far. Lots happened since. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. All right, Scott, did you have any questions anywhere or any comments? Well, I was asking questions of the audience. You know, I asked them. You know what? Uh, um, you know how deep in the sky that the audience has has seen with their telescopes and. Um, didn't get a clear answer, but uh, um, you know, but I know that many of them have actually seen. All of us have seen galaxies and and uh, these kinds of things. Um, Coy Wagner says he's watching on Facebook. He says not sure if this is the deepest object I've seen, but Dave Kriege let me see Einstein's cross mm-hmm. and his twenty-five inch obsession at Okitex. Wow! Right. And I remember finding 3C273, and that's 2 billion light years away, something like that. So, looked that's like amazing. A, a blue dot, but, the, well, that but I got it. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. So, uh, there you have it. You have some of the, the top 10 reasons, not all of them, because I got some secret ones in there, but top 10 reasons for stargazing. And uh, they're, they're my reasons, and I have approached other people asking him about this, so I kind of got a general idea of what, what people would think, too. But, uh, you know, keep these things in mind when you're out under the stars. You're just not there, you know, looking at, at, at stars and swatting mosquitoes off you. You know, you're taking in the night, you're listening to the crickets, you're seeing the fireflies, the hearing the katydids, you hear owls, you've got meteors going over, you've got stars. Awesome stuff. Perfect night. All right. Uh, Anybody else got anything they'd like to say? I just wanted to say that I thought that John, your talk, your lecture was absolutely fabulous. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, well, that's quite a compliment. Thank you. I personally personally like the the Tosca story best. (laughs) (laughs) I think everybody could relate to that. Yeah. All right. Well, um, thank you all for watching. We will be back with AO Live on September 22nd. Uh, Please join us then. I will have more details coming up on the GSPs. Chuck Allen will be joining you Tuesday on the GSP. So, Scott, um, I'm going to turn it over to you, but thanks again for everyone that's here. Eric, could I just say a couple of lines? Sure can. Jump Uh, in there. I want to just remind everyone, particularly our league members out there, 
that are asking questions about when their uh, club information is going to be on the website. The national office will be mailing, emailing something very soon to your Alcor uh, asking for a roster update that will be happening approximately in the next two weeks. So we haven't forgotten about those and we really appreciate your helping us out on that. We uh, purposely uh, uh, deleted those from the, the system because much of our data needed updating. So I think you'll uh, have much more accurate information once we get it up there. The next thing I'll just uh, mention briefly, uh, the next Alcon will be held, uh, I think in the month of July of 2024. Uh, we don't know the dates for sure, and it'll be in Kansas City, Missouri. So mark your calendars roughly. We'll have much more information following shortly. Thank you. Sounds good. We all look forward to Kansas City. We had a great there. What time? When was what year was it? We were in Kansas City last time. It was two thousand and four. Yeah, we had a great time. And David will be one of the speakers there. David Levy will be speaking. I can even give you the title. Working on the That's title. what I heard. There was a title already done. And the title is Shoemaker Levy Nine Meets Jupiter Thirty Years Later. <laughs> that sounds great. Yeah, personal story. All right. Well, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Please join us again on September 22nd. And everyone have a great weekend. And Scott, thank you. I'm going to turn this over to you. All right. Well, I'm I'm just going to uh, toot the Astronomical League's horn again. Um, you know, the... Alcon was an amazing event. Uh, you know, not only the talks, not only the you know the uh, different activities that we did, but it was meeting everybody. You know, being there, seeing all your friends, and making new friends. I made new friends at at uh, uh, the Alcon, and uh, it was just uh, it was invigorating. That's what I can tell you. So uh, I've been to many of them, but uh, every time I go to one. It's like I learn something new. I, I hear, uh, you know, an amazing lecture. I hear uh, amazing conversations that are going on. And yeah, we make new friends. We see old friends and uh, we carry on in our community. Um, I also want to toot the horn of the Reflector. Uh, uh, this magazine is an amazing magazine. It's uh, one of the great benefits of being a member of the Astronomical League. And uh, this last issue was about the 87th Cellophane Convention. If you've never been to Cellophane? I haven't, okay? But um, it, is, uh, it was featured in the magazine and, uh, you know, uh, it's all about experiencing uh, what was called or what is called the original Star Party. So um, uh, there was more information, stellar photometry for amateurs, Ancient Galactic Artifacts. Okay, so you got to read this magazine, uh, check it out, and um, it is available if you just go to uh, the Astronomical League's website, which is astroleague.org, and you can click on the reflector, but if you're a member, uh, you get to hold that copy in your hand, so that's very cool. Um, and what else can we say? Uh, you know... Do what uh, Jack Borkheimer always told us to do and keep looking up. I have something. I have one, one more thing here. One more. Just, just for all uh, promoting something, I wanted to show you the, the fantasy eclipse glasses. There you go. League is selling. You're going to have to go on uh, the, the website and to the league store, and we have those up there. Those um, look cool. I like, the, yeah. I like the what looks like a black hole in the center. <laughs> well, of course, it's an eclipse, right? Yeah, the, the, the black hole is really a sketch done by uh, Cindy Cratch from the 2017 eclipse. Oh, wow. You know, most of the glasses you see out there will have some image of this of a, of a solar eclipse. Well, this is a sketch of one and it's it's pretty detailed. And also on the back, it has the place where you can write your 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 name, date and time uh, so you wow. can keep these as uh, as for uh, memorabilia and uh, commemorative glasses. So uh, look on the website. Yeah, somebody was thinking when they did that. So that's oh. very cool. <laughs> All right.
Thank you very much, everyone, and thanks for tuning in to uh, this month's Astronomical League Live. Uh, we'll be back. Do we know that when the next one's going to be, Terry? Yeah, yeah it's going to be September 22nd at 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight. Well, yeah, we're still Eastern Daylight, I think, time. Daylight time? Yeah. Is it November when we go back or something? I think it's first November. Sunday. Yeah, first Sunday of November. Yeah. First Sunday of November. Okay. Yep. So right. September 22nd, please join us. All right. That's great. Okay. Well, let's see. I think I might have a little video I can show you guys from NASA. I love these little things. Um, and um, here we go. A young planet whirling closely around a red dwarf star is changing in unpredictable ways with each orbit. NASA's Hubble Space Telescope observations initially showed the planet wasn't losing its atmosphere to its parent star. One and a half years later, Hubble observations revealed clear signs that the star's torrential blasts of energy, called a stellar wind, were stripping the planet's hydrogen atmosphere. These extreme changes between orbits, and over such a short period of time, shocked astronomers. Red dwarfs are the most abundant stars in our Milky Way galaxy, and they likely host most of our galaxy's planets. But can these planets be hospitable to life? These new Hubble results suggest that this particular red dwarf may have sudden and extremely variable outbursts. Under these intense conditions, planets forming within the first 100 million years of the red dwarf star's birth should experience the greatest loss of their atmosphere, possibly stripping it away completely. One possible explanation for the vastly different Hubble observations is that the torrential stellar wind shapes the planet's atmospheric loss, sometimes making it observable and at other times not. It may even cause some of the outflow to hiccup out ahead of the planet itself. Stellar models predict this hiccup, but Hubble provided the first observational evidence of it happening, and to an extreme degree. Thanks to Hubble, we're learning more about how planets form and survive around stars very different from our own, helping us uncover the mysteries of the universe. Thank <laughs> you.